Creating antagonists for a series is one of the hardest parts of making a compelling story. The villain or villains are the characters who from their introduction forward is an end goal for your main cast. All of the story's progression, the plots drive forward, it's usually in service of resolving the issues being created by this antagonistic force. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I'm some big writer man in an office somewhere drafting up the next big hit series with pure perfection. I'm just some dipshit who reads a lot of manga, plays a lot of video games, and watches a bunch of shows, movies, whatever. But as some asshole sitting around consuming all of these stories, the thing I've noticed that hooks me harder than anything else when discovering a new manga or show is how much I can love your villain. Now I'm not saying they all have to be perfectly well written zenith of the medium characters. Like Cell from Dragon Ball Z is as basic as it gets for a villain and dude kicks shit, I love every form of them. But it's when a series takes the real human fear that an actual evil person can just radiate and presents it to you in a way that's uncomfortably relatable. The villains that any media bullshit stripped away could be a completely real person whose mind you can kind of even understand even if they're they're objectively wrong and disgusting. The haha, I have a god complex, now the ants must be crushed under me. Generic mindset that tons of series end up having doesn't mean they're all just like outright bad. I'm a shonen manga meathead, what defense can I possibly have? But what makes an antagonist interesting on a whole other level is when you can understand and maybe even to an extent empathize with this object of pure evil. Almost to the point where you even sometimes lose the thread of morality yourself and say, you know what, fuck it, I'm down to see Tony Soprano win, I mean, he's not that bad of a guy. Or, no, no, you, you don't see, Walter White had to do all those things, they were for his family, he even brought the dipping sticks. Because sometimes the villain is just so fucking fun and you want to see them win, even if their darkness is directly in your face for the entire world to see. And to bring it around to the point of my video, I recently finished Ajin Demi-Human, a manga that I truly believe, without a doubt, has created one of the best villains of all time. So much so that this video is pretty much dedicated to the legend himself, the unstoppable man in the Peaky Blonders ass newsboy hat, Samuel T. Owen, aka Sato. Breaking down the first few chapters, the world of Ajin is, for the most part, the same as ours. The minor difference though, back in Africa a few years ago there was a rebel soldier who died in combat and uh, they came back to life, good as new ready to keep on living and fighting with these weird black particles pouring out of their body and regenerating any wounds. After his eventual capture and failed cover up operation by the US military, it led to the worldwide discovery of Ajin, the Japanese word for demi-human, beginning a massive arms race between leading nations to secure one for themselves. These Ajin do not die, literally, legit no matter what you do, how much pain you cause them, how extreme the method. Upon an unnatural death, those black particles will come out and regenerate their bodies, and then bam, they're back to how they were right before dying. Now they're the same as normal humans, and any damage or lost part hurts them just the same as it would another person, but upon an actual death, it's all regenerated and fixed back to new. A literal painful immortality. The biggest catch though is no one can possibly know they're a demi-human until they die, so most people live their daily lives assuming they aren't one because how could you know otherwise? Also, unknown to the general public and most of the government, these demi-humans have the ability to form these black particles I mentioned inside of themselves to create a black ghost that only other demi-humans can see, referred to as invisible black matter shortened to IBMs by the anti ajin squad, using them for all kinds of different things in both their day-to-day -day lives and for most of the series in combat. <laughs> Small side note, it was seeing this page of a black ghost before knowing anything about the series that made me want to start it. I figured it was about fucked up monsters and humans that had to deal with them and these pages looked raw as hell. It was kind of right, I guess. Anyway, this perfect regeneration becomes a theoretical pot of gold as Ajin can be used as eternally living human test subjects. Which as soon as one is reported to the government by a random citizen for a supposed basic ass reward fee, they are captured and never to be seen outside of a lab again, the remainder of their seemingly eternal lives being kept under straps and wraps, their bodies used for gruesome and violent research without any care to the demi-human themselves. 
Since the invulnerability of the demi-humans is a constant issue that the government agents trying to capture them face, they are standard issue tools for combat mostly revolving around tranquilizer rounds. The smarter tactical option for subduing a demi-human being not to just kill them endlessly, but instead to knock them out and haul them off to the previously mentioned testing labs. So, with all of that being said, a careless truck one day slams into equally as careless main character Kei Nagai in front of God and everybody, splattering him and spreading his insides all over the street. And he just gets back up, good as new despite being turned to mulch, his body reforming around him as he comes back to life sending everyone watching into a frenzy because, hey, first person to capture him and turn this kid in gets paid. After escaping the money-hungry mob and being rescued by his childhood friend, they take off into the hills together and run from the greedy snitches and cops who are hunting for the immortal threat to national security, also setting up the demi-human control squad and Tosaki, the guy who leads it. Big Tokyo Ghoul vibes, honestly, what with the human-esque monsters and the government organization that exists to capture them. And of course, the final player to establish in this story, the one and only tank of a man himself, Sato. Now after this first volume, the story kind of like, completely shifts. I mean, to be fair, it was only like five chapters in, but behind the scenes of the manga, it was actually a duo project between Gamon Sakurai doing the art and as far as I can tell, Ajin was his first actual series, and Suin Amira, creator of High Rise Invasion, was doing the story. The duo started with doing the initial one-shot chapter together, following the story of a boy named Shinya who was one of the first Ajin ever captured by the Japanese government before shit went haywire. This chapter and the events being referenced in a part of the main story once it had officially begun running in the Kodansha-owned magazine Good Afternoon. There are so many random manga magazines out there, like goddamn. At the start of Volume 2 though, Miura's name was completely removed from the credits, and going forward both the story and art were credited to Sakurai, with Chapter 6's title being called A Fresh Start, and it mimicking the one-shot in its opening. So while I was digging around for info on what exactly happened during the split, the actual sources online were kind of almost non-existent, and I had originally written here that the mystery continued. Thankfully, I came across a great video that actually just found the answers themselves. This video by Swub is specifically about that split and how cool Ajin is in general. Them detailing a 2017 post by Sakurai on his Twitter that literally spells out most of the info. Those two only starting the manga together due to a request from the magazine specifically, the artist and author not even really knowing who the other was at the time. Sakurai had speculated that since these duo teams were very popular in the scene to readers, citing Bakuman's popularity as an example, the magazine thought it would make for a good project even if the two had literally never even met, and never did meet during those chapters' creations. For reasons still unknown to Sakurai himself, Mira had to pull out of the manga at chapter 5 and it was decided by the higher ups that he would take over the plot as well as already doing the art. Sakurai himself having no idea what Mira's overall plans were and having to stop and draw it all out right then and there the path the story would take. And based on what we ended up getting, it may have wound up being the perfect storm of events. And shouts out Swa for that info, like it was out there for the whole world to see but no one had for some reason and that's some pretty important shit. Also, just a heads up, this video is gonna have spoilers from here forward because to talk about Sato, we, we really gotta get in there. The first volume definitely gave me the feeling of, gotcha, we're gonna fight back against the evil government squad, protect the good demi-humans from the villain agents, and the main character is going to give in to his murderous urges, literally Tokyo Ghoul. But after Sakurai took over, both the story and the art itself would take a hard left turn, revealing that Kei is emotionally broken as a human, his real personality being kind of a cold, unlikable piece of shit him feeling almost nothing towards any person other than himself, only helping save lives because he feels some kind of human obligation to someone that's directly in danger in front of him, or someone who may have helped him out once before, with no other compassion and emotions felt. The anti-demi-human squad who seem to be the enemy faction is actually in an internal battle with a bigger government who keeps pushing back on them as they try and handle these growing situations. Tosaki and his crew going rogue and running their own ops boldly in the face of the government opposition to stop the coming destruction. 
and Sato, who literally decides, man, this shit's all stupid and boring. What if I just went dicko and fuck the world up? committing massive acts of terrorism all across Japan, showing leaked footage of the experiments done to Ajin like him in secret and declaring his own personal war on humanity. His message reaching out to Ajin everywhere as he proudly posts videos online basically saying, you humans are all fucked and call me DMX cause I'm gonna give it to you. And when I say massive acts of terrorism, I am not underselling it. This explosive war he launches literally stops any other plot threads in their tracks. K being a fugitive in the anti ajin squad's hunt for him no longer really mattering at all, completely shifting K's loner mental state and now realizing that he has to help stop Sato, or else as a demi-human, he'll never have a safe and comfortable peace of mind in this new world that's being created. The anti ajin squad actually recruiting K to help fight back against Sato since their higher ups in the government are choosing to compromise and surrender to his rampage instead of fighting. And as Sato continues to pull off these extreme atrocities, the cash trying to stop him and failing over and over as bodies just pile up left and right. After a while without even noticing, you just start to root for Sato. Somehow in the trail of corpses and explosions he's left behind, you've ended up cheering for him. Not because of what he's doing, like the dude's pure evil, but it's more so how he's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> わ我々は追い詰められた。だから決断せざるを得なかった。我々は武力によって住みよい国づくりをスタートさせる。まだ参戦を迷っているアジンのためにも圧倒的な戦闘力を披露しよう。無関係だと思っている人間たち、いよい
The way an experienced character holds and uses his weapon, the formation and methods used by the anti-demi-human squad, the methodical detail to the art of the guns themselves, the realistic violence a bullet can cause, and just how unstoppable one experienced man with no regard for himself is with a gun. Sure, he's an unkillable man, but he's just one dude. So watching him literally flex on entire squads over and over and over, chopping his own arm off after he gets hit with a tranquilizer dart, and then using that arm stump to balance his neck shots, willingly popping a shot in his head if he needs to literally game over himself, only to revive it 100% and instantly use another life, like he's stacking one-ups in goddamn Contra. It reminds me of, like, The Terminator, the first movie specifically, mixed with John Wick. Yeah, Arnold was literally a slasher movie villain at first, but he's so endearing to watch as an unstoppable killing machine. Him storming the police station and looking for Sarah Connor is still like such a great fucking action scene. And then you take that unstoppable and unkillable violence and combine it with the fluidity and knowledge of Keanu doing sick ass gunkata with his grapples and hand to hand tactics. And every time Sato is on page, it feels like these same unstoppable killing machines are combined together and walking forward, shotgun ready with a fucking unforgettable smirk on his face. And from Volume 1 all the way to the conclusion of the series, Sato leads the whole world down a path of violent gunplay. Him breezing through shootout after shootout and dropping tons of enforcement that stand in his way with a clean and precise brutality. No matter what plan you have, he's a step ahead. No matter how many people you have, he still has you outgunned. No matter what you do, he can't be stopped. And looking past his unstoppable Terminator nature is one of the most enjoyable antagonists I've ever seen. So one of the earliest glimpses into Sato's mind you get is a moment where his and Kay's IBM ghosts start to blast ass in a fist fight, them both hooking the other's heads in a cross counter. During this moment, there's a flash into Kay's mind of images of Sato's past just for a second. And in this flashback, Kay saw what was assumed to be Sato's father beating his ass as a kid and doing the abusive parent, I'm sorry, I have to do this thing. Now at the time, I'll admit despite liking Sato more and more with how ruthlessly enjoyable he was, I was kind of like, ah, okay, this is gonna be one of those dad beat the insanity into me backstories, I gotcha, and kind of just shrugged it off. So when it shows the rest of the flashback later, Sato just chilling in a barn full of dead animals he killed when he was like eight and his dad had hit him out of an obvious combination of fear and anger at this tiny monster in front of him, Sato himself having no reaction at all to any of these things, an almost blank expression on his face during it. And let me tell you, I was pumped. Fuck yeah, Sato wasn't the classic, my dad was the true villain antagonist who only did bad things because of his past. Nah, 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 fuck that. Sato is Sato because that's who the fuck he is. He's brutal, he's vicious, he's evil personified, and he's having so much fucking fun with it. Before he even knew of his demi-human powers, he lived however he wanted and was just as ruthlessly carefree as he is now, pulling mercenary jobs across the world between his downtime of playing video games, laughing in the face of his first death wondering if he got a high score in life like he's goddamn Gold Roger about to be executed, no knowledge that he was actually about to come back to life as an Ajin. He doesn't give a shit about his own well-being, hell, he'll be fine anyway, what's it matter? When he first meets Nick guy and is helping him understand his power a bit more. He makes mention that, regeneration aside, losing your brain means losing the you that exists. Like let's be real, we are all just brains controlling meat and bones after all, so a brand new brain is the same as a brand new you. This idea kind of hangs over Nagai's head consistently through the whole series, never really wanting to lose who he is so to say. And Sato, the one who made this honestly pretty thoughtful point about immortality, immediately does not give a shit about any of that and will grind his entire body into mist so he can blow himself into an industrial fan, spreading through a building's AC system with the intention to regenerate in a restricted area and just start his killing spree again. Suicide means nothing to him, decapitation means nothing to him, death itself means nothing to him. No one could possibly stop Sato, and in turn, Sato will never stop. 
This mindset, this brutal warpath he walks down with a shit-eating grin, all culminates in the final battle in his War for Japan, Sato leading a small uprising of both Ajin winning personal freedoms and humans who just agree with his rhetoric. The plan? Infiltrate a highly guarded naval base on the coast during a routine media event. Once inside, Sato and his main team will assume direct control of key points of defense, with Sato himself hopping in one of the fighter jets stationed around the fort and taking off. The B team is to cause chaos in the crowds, distract military personnel, and most importantly, keep K Nagai away since he's the only person who can force his emotionally stunted mind to work like Sato's, always trying to guess his next move. K is kind of a mid-protagonist to be real, but uh, that's totally fair in the scale of the story, and I do feel like it's absolutely on purpose. The cast constantly calls him out for his indifference on the lives of others and his willingness to use them as pawns in his plans, but no matter how callous and cold he tries to be, he still knows right from wrong and that only his mentally ill brain can match the same wavelength as Sato's, making him the only person who may have a chance against him. And it does make K growingly more enjoyable throughout the series as he finds and loses connections that he initially would never value. Him showing off non-stop how despite his shitbag personality, dude's pretty fucking smart and knows how to read anyone around him really well. The only person who can get any kind of a read on Sato. Oh, and speaking of Sato, he's taken full control of the fort, having the Prime Minister of Japan held hostage and beginning the final wave of his assault, using the military jets to fly at mock speed across Japan. His next plan? Crash into key political points all around the nation, effectively crippling its entire government and destabilizing the whole country. The catch? He had chopped his arm off and left it back at base, so upon crashing and his death, his body regenerates at that arm. He grabs the next jet and the mission resets. Solid plan, honestly. This cycle continues over and over. K and the team fighting through the fort to find Sato's arm and stop his regeneration, Sato all the while just grabbing jets and taking off to find his next targets. A non-stop action-paced race against time. The longer the battle takes, the more places get hit by the crashes. The rumored anti ajin special forces finally deployed to assault the fort, no longer being delayed by Jimmy to Chin and his higher-ups, letting Sakurai flex his love of that artistic military detail. This squad being absolute massive badasses who are the first humans to feel like an actual challenge to the demi-humans, them both dropping and capturing Sato's troops. The clock keeps ticking, the bodies keep piling up, and on Sato's 6th or 7th run in the middle of his flight, he just stops. The crashes no longer continue when he turns the jet around, making his way back to the base. Shocked, everyone freezes. Why is he stopping? Why is he coming back? We had just stolen the hand. We had him trapped. How did he know? Was this all his plan to let them find the regenerating arm and go from there? Is this all his grand design? Nah, nah, nothing that complicated. Nagai realizes, after all of this, the non-stop death and combat over the proverbial freedom of Japan. Sato's war against humanity, here at the finishing line of almost destroying the nation itself, Sato's gotten bored. He was no longer having fun. He decides it would be more entertaining to just skip ahead to either go have a final battle with Nagai now or even instead, maybe just hop on a boat and head to the USA because in his own words, we're dominating the console market now, which uh, sorry Sato, I regret to inform you in 2023, we absolutely are not. At the end of the day, this whole war thing he was doing in the mass reformation of Japan itself had just gotten kind of old, and that's it. This moment right here, I knew Sato was one of my most favorite antagonists ever. The unstoppable machine who brought an entire nation to its knees, the worldwide definition of evil itself. Just stopped his entire main villain plot because eh, shit got boring, I'ma go do something else, catch me in Oklahoma playing Far Cry 2, bitch. And when you back up and look at Sato through the whole series, he's been this exact dude the entire time. He has always, both before the story proper and during his rampages, operated on having a good time. If, if he's not, not fun, having fun, why then why the if fuck should he battle, care? He's presented fun? in his military history flashbacks as being emotionless, only feeling any sort of spark when his life is in danger. 
deep behind enemy lines under fire with almost no hope of escape being the only situation he really felt happy in. If he wasn't risking death, if he was just succeeding with no resistance, where's the fun in that? Why do you think in every action scene he has that grin? He's just loving every second of it, and that's literally it. No big grandstanding ideas, he doesn't give a fuck about the other demi-humans or if he himself is captured or somehow even killed. He's just going full force because eh, why not? In almost any situation, he ends up making metaphors comparing his current battlefield to a video game. Because to him, this warpath is just a fun pastime like games are to us. And for me, that propelled Sato to being one of my most favorite villains of all time. Because goddamn if that isn't just the most relatable goal I have ever seen. Everything I do in life now, I try and revolve around having fun, like I'm 27 years old going on 28. If I'm not having fun by this point, I'm literally wasting time and dying faster. Sure, uh, my idea of fun is a little bit different than Sato's, but this basic level of operation and ideal brings him to such a personal level. One that he was honestly already pretty much on through the whole story with his non-stop one-liners and general happy attitude as he stood over dozens of bodies, making him just a real-ass dude. Insane and undying, but real. In the final volume of the series, there is a short afterword by Sakurai, him acknowledging the author-artist's change and going on both to apologize and offer his thanks. He mentions how he felt he had betrayed the reader's expectations, some people gearing up for the potential story that was created in the first volume, but quickly changed and reworked to match his sensibilities. Him admitting that he took massive influence from his love of 80s to early 2000s American action movies, and that this was honestly the only kind of story he knew how to make. The series itself surviving as long as it did from the consistently solid sales and support for each volume from fans over nine whole years. Ajin actually only ending in March of 2021. And while I absolutely understand his mindset on that kind of torch that he was passed, there's like a lot of pressure there, no doubt. I think that that exact passion and love of action is what made Sato and Ajin as a whole stand out and plant its flag down as one of the most fuck yeah bud series I've ever read. For the same reasons that made me love Bleach, Shaman King, Trigun, and Helsing, Ajin is just one dude pouring what he loves into his work, letting it kind of shape and create the path forward through his actual passion, and man, it just fucking rules, I love it. Apologize if you want, sure, but you made peak fiction so all is forgiven. This was a weird video to make for me because I usually do these big series retrospective type things and try and dive deep into them, but like... Ajin doesn't really need that, I think. All you really need to know is that the art goes hard, the story is extremely fun, and Sato is one of the best characters, like, ever. <laughs> now, how would I recommend you get into Ajin since it obviously does have an anime created by Polygon Pictures and produced by Netflix? I mean, as you've seen, I obviously for sure prefer the manga. The art and action is just literally on a level of its own in the manga game, and I cannot recommend it enough. As for the anime, I mean, eh. It has a really great OST done by Yugo Kano, who is the main composer of the JoJo anime, and personally, that soundtrack is one of the best in anime, with Sato's theme specifically being so fucking raw and unpredictable, just kinda like Sato himself. But I can't sit here and lie and say I don't understand the divide on its CGI. While I do totally think it has extremely well done action scenes, like the fluidity of the minute to minute violence Sato can cause in the manga is translated over extremely well and is really fun to watch. Even if in this one they went way hard on the CG smoke effects and it just looks real disorienting like I have trouble even telling what's going on in some of this fight. But even so, with some fantastic character models and super stylish fluidity aside, there's just as many scenes that look rough and straight up give me an uncanny valley feeling. I think CGI has come a really long way and can be used in anime no issue at all anymore. Talked about it in the Helsing video just a month back or so, but I do think a lot of series that were still growing in the mid-2010s got hit with that awkwardness. The slower out-of-combat minute-to-minute scenes just looking rough at times. 
They also censored the plane crash and removed it completely. Like, like I get it, but also that's lame. Solid action moments, but yeah, for sure prefer the manga. Also, season two came out during serialization and was anime only filler. Compared to the manga's later events, in my opinion, it's just really not great, honestly. The series has a full English release by Vertical Comics that I think is a solid print. I have them all myself. Bit small, but eh, I don't really mind that. There was some discourse about the translation on its release, and I could see where the complaints come from. There's a few examples that people pointed out that can absolutely feel a bit odd. But during my read through, I honestly never had any complaints, so I personally don't mind the vertical prints. Also has some color pages in there, so thumbs up for me, I guess. If you want some badass action with minimal amounts of dialogue in your life, all fueled by one of the most entertaining and outright show-stealing villains ever, Ajin may just be for you. Thanks for watching, hit the Patreon below, sub to your boy, drop a comment, all that shit. And as usual, I'll be back with something random. I'm not even sure what this channel is. I'm out here doing prison school, Helsing, and now Ajin in a row. Where's the through line? Anyway, see you next time.